The Characters of Easter podcast with Dan Darling is brought to you by the Life Audio Podcast Network and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Hello and welcome to the Characters of Easter podcast. This is Dan Darling, a pastor, author, writer, I'm senior VP at the National Religious Broadcasters. And uh, this podcast is based on my book, The Characters of Easter, which is available from Moody Press and available anywhere you buy books. You could go to my website, danieldarling.com slash Easter and find all sorts of downloadable uh, stuff there if you want to do this with your church or with your group. Uh, thankful for Life Audio for partnering with me for this. So this episode, I want to talk about Pontius Pilate. And I want to read here from the Apostles' Creed, which says, I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born under the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. It's interesting, the oldest Christian creed, this Apostles' Creed, mentions suffered under Pontius Pilate. Now, we know why the creed includes that. In my mind, I think there's two reasons why the creed includes Pontius Pilate. First of all, it was a historical marker. So if you're reading the creed, you could easily go research and find that uh, there really was a governor of Judea named Pontius Pilate who was appointed to that position by Caesar, by the Roman government. And it was one marker that could tell you that this really happened, that what we believe about Easter what we believe in terms of Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead, we don't just believe it as kind of this sort of ethereal feel-good thing. We believe that it historically happened. And that mentioning of Pontius Pilate is a marker. I think there's another subtle reason why it's in the creed is because I think the church rightly was trying to point out a clash of two kingdoms here. You see the kingdoms of men and the kingdom of God. If you were in Judea in the first century, you would know who Pilate was. You would fear Pilate because he had a lot of power. Jesus of Nazareth was gaining popularity. He had a following, but really outside of the Palestine, you really wouldn't know his name. But I think the authors of the creed are making a point that today we only know Pilate because of Jesus. We only know him as a because he has a bit part in the story of God's kingdom coming to earth in Christ. And I think that's an important thing. Uh, One of the things you're going to see in the life of Pilate is that he thinks he has the power. He thinks Jesus is on trial before him, but he's really on trial before the Son of God. So let's talk a little bit about who Pontius Pilate was. Now, when I think of Pilate, (laughs) my mind always goes to Easter pageants. And I I participated in quite a few growing up, and I'm sure you have if you're listening to this, or maybe you haven't, maybe you're not someone who's churched, but you may have watched the you know movies that depict this. My first thought goes to uh, the film Ben Hur, one of my favorite films of all time, and the character played really, I think, to perfection by an Australian actor named Frank Thring. And when I think of Pontius Pilate, I think of a middle-aged, average kind of looking man with a close crop haircut and kind of a dad bod. And for whatever reason, in every depiction I've ever seen, whether it's a church play or a movie, he has a wispy goatee and sandals. Really, in Easter pageants, it seems like anyone can play Pilate in terms of casting, if you're in your church. Uh, the casting call is usually uh, the dink, the deacon's bench. Uh, all you need is a robe, uh, a bald spot, and kind of a bewildered look. But Pontius Pilate was a real person in place and time. Um, he, he was someone who had vast amounts of authority and who was a pivotal figure in history. So I think to fully understand who he is, I think we have to zoom out a bit and understand some of the history that places this rising Roman politician on a collision course with this itinerant rabbi from Nazareth 
named Jesus. And really, it begins before Pilate. It begins with Herod. There's a lot of circumstances in history that worked to put Pilate and Jesus on this collision course. Uh, it begins with Herod, and not just one Herod, but a succession of Herods. It's, it's easy to read the scriptures and kind of get your Herods mix, mixed up. Uh, that's happened to me, too. In the characters of Christmas, I talk a little bit about the various Herods that uh, are there in the Gospels. Uh, there's several Herods who rule that part of the world, and it kind of get confusing trying to sort them out. The first was Herod the Great, who ruled the entire region for 40 years, right up until the time of Jesus' birth. This Herod was a legendary builder. He created some of the most amazing architecture and masterpieces um, in the world. Uh, still, people look, look back today and marvel at, at some of the building he did, including large aqueducts that brought water from the Mediterranean uh throughout Israel, which is an incredible feat. Water management has always been an important feature, whether it's uh, the year 2021 or it's the first century. And he was amazing. I've actually been to Israel and I've been uh, there and I've seen some of the, the aqueducts that are still there and it's just amazing. But uh, Herod was not loved. Uh, he was feared and he was also very ruthless. The other thing Herod did before we get to his ruthlessness, he also rebuilt the temple. In fact, it was so remarkable how well, much he built the temple that there's that passage in the Gospels where the disciples are asking Jesus, doesn't this just amaze you? And Jesus, of course, says, you know, it's going to one day be destroyed. Uh, and it was by the Roman general Titus in AD 70. But Herod, as we said, is not was not loved. He was feared. He had deep insecurities that shaped the way he led. Uh, he had a, this deep paranoia about being replaced. He had three sons and a wife killed. He committed infanticide against the baby boys in Bethlehem in Matthew 2 when he heard the news from the Magi that Jesus, a new king of the Jews, would be born. He he was so ruthless and cruel that Caesar Augustus once said that it would be better to have been Herod's pig than his son. Just FYI, it's not a compliment when a Caesar thinks you're a little bit authoritarian. When Caesar thinks you're going a little too far, you are. So that's Herod the Great. When he died, his will dictated that the vast territory he ruled be divided among his three remaining sons, uh, Herod Philip, Herod Antipas, and Herod Archelaus. Herod Antipas, whose territory included Galilee, is the ruler that you see who ordered John the Baptist beheaded for speaking out about Antipas's adultery with Herod Philip's wife. Antipas is also the ruler before whom Jesus would appear in his trial. He is ruling over uh, the Galilee region, the area where Jesus grew up, where uh, the, many of the disciples grew up there, uh, Capernaum and Bethsaida and Nazareth are all kind of part of that Galilee region. Herod Archelaus is the lesser known of the three sons. So you have Herod Antipas, you had Herod Philip, and you have Herod Archelaus. He's a lesser known of the three sons, but he seemed to inherit his father's cruelty. He was also very inept. In fact, he was so bad that a delegation of Jewish leaders actually traveled to Rome and, and successfully petitioned Caesar to replace him. And if you're Rome, Rome wanted... Uh, Judea to be peaceful. It was strategic. It was an important bridge between Egypt and Syria. It's interesting how that Middle East region has always been pivotal in world history, no matter who is a world power. And it was then and it is now. Caesar couldn't afford instability in that region. So he, he quickly cycled through a series of governors to replace Herod, um, Herod Archelaus, none of whom would be able to solidify control. Eventually, they landed on Pontius Pilate, who is a kind of a mid-level Roman politician. Um, he was recommended by a benefactor high up in the Roman government named Sejanus. So, a lot of backstory here. This outpost was not exactly a plum posting for an aspiring politician uh, in Rome. This would be like you know becoming ambassador to some backwater country. Uh, and never being heard from again. Almost in some ways seems like a punishment. And and it also was just a huge mess and nobody wanted to take that job. So Pilate takes this role. 
probably Pilate took it because he didn't have a choice, but he also might have seen it as a stepping stone to something greater. But even though Pilate was probably the most able uh, at governing Judea, he too quickly got caught in the quagmire that was Judea. Now, again, being um, governor of Judea was tricky because Rome gave Israel, they gave the Jewish people some measure of autonomy for how they can conduct their religious services, religious practices. They gave them some autonomy on how the temple was governed to kind of do, uh, to kind of, they, they even had autonomy on sort of civil, some civil law and the way they handle things. But there was a lot of um, tension back and forth in Judea. And here's a few flashpoints that, that happened in history leading up to Jesus and Pilate facing each other. Not long after he assumed power, Pilate ordered Roman soldiers to place large defensive shields bearing the likeness of Caesar in Jerusalem. This was a cultural and racial affront to the Jewish people. It was a highly insensitive gesture that Pilate did to try to ingratiate himself to Tiberius, who was the Caesar, but it actually brought tremendous opposition and protest from the Jewish people. Um, the Jewish people protested. They even followed him back to his palace in Caesarea, and eventually Pilate had to back down. Another flashpoint was Pilate raided the temple treasury for money. You know, the, the treasury, uh, the Jewish people would collect gifts and offerings in the temple, and they would use this to fund the temple police. They use it to fund the upkeep of the temple. Well, Pilate raided the temple treasury for funds in order to fund a freshwater project to bring freshwater into Jerusalem. And this caused great protest by the Jewish people. Pilate made it worse by putting down the protest by hiding Roman soldiers in the crowd disguised as protesters, and they used knives to kill quite a few Jewish people. So again, the relationship between Pilate and the Jewish people was very raw at this point. And then there's a situation that you see in Luke 13, 1 that's mentioned in Galilee. His Roman troops massacred some Galileans while they were worshiping uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, their blood mixing with the blood of the sacrifices. So Pilate could be brutal. He could be cruel when he tried to control and rule. By the time Jesus was put on trial before Pilate, Pilate had zero political capital, and his standing with Rome was on very thin ice. So that gives you some idea of why he's so hesitant and so nervous at the trial of Jesus. He'd not only squandered his political capital, his leadership capital, but the benefactor who'd, recommend, who'd recommended him for this posting was off the scene, lost his influence, had actually been executed. So every move by Pilate is being watched at this point. And he's very nervous. So it's good when we open the Gospels and we read about Pontius Pilate to remember there's a history that informs and influences the decisions he makes. He's a man hanging on to his position by a thread who despises the people he's tasked with leading. You can just hear the condescension in his voice in the Gospels. He doesn't understand the Jewish people. He doesn't respect their traditions. He's tired of having to deal with all the problems. Um, he's got a tenuous alliance with the religious leaders, the Sadducees, who were close to Rome, Roman power, who despised Jesus. But you can kind of hear some desperation in Pilate and uneasiness with the way that he handles the trial of Jesus. And he both disdains these people, but he's scared of what will happen with his position, which is not uncommon with leadership, right? That you see a lot of leaders who are called to lead people that they totally despise or they don't understand, but they're afraid of them because they want to keep their position, keep their power. Now, I want to speed through a little bit of this, but Jesus' trial was in three parts. There was the religious inquisition, first by Annas and Caiaphas, the the, the high priest, and then the former high priest, who was kind of a, a shadow high priest because he had a lot of uh, influence. Then there was the full Sanhedrin, and finally there was the legal proceedings in front of Pilate. The religious trial was for blasphemy and happened in front of both Annas, the retired high priest, and Caiaphas, the, the actual chief priest, appointed by Pilate, but beholden to Annas. Then Jesus was given a full hearing before the full Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council. It was primarily made up of Sadducees 
And we'll get into the different kinds of religious leaders in another podcast, but also had some Pharisees like Nicodemus and others on there. The religious leaders needed the Roman government. They needed Pilate in this case because they didn't just want to reprimand Jesus. They wanted him dead. At some level, they had autonomy to carry out executions for blasphemy. According to Jewish law, blasphemy should result in stoning. And sometimes Rome looked the other way when chief priests sought to put people to death. So if you think John 10, 31, you think of the case of Stephen in Acts 7. But really, Rome only had the authority to carry the kind of state execution they wanted to see Jesus suffer. Also, the religious leaders, I think they wanted the Roman government to do their dirty work for them in this case. Now, there's a few reasons for the religious leaders why they had animus toward Jesus. We're going to get into that a little bit in a future podcast. But one was his claims of deity. Even though he his works fulfilled the, the scripture's definition of, of a Messiah. But it's more likely that they saw Jesus as a threat to their way of life. Particularly the, the Sadducees, who were less interested in the spiritual renewal and more were more aligned with Rome and power. They were kind of the elite. They were um, not very many in number, but they had a lot of power. They had an arrangement with Rome that gave them power. Jesus directly criticized and exposed their hypocrisy, and they did not like it. So it seems they wanted a kind of a state execution as, as a national re- rejection of Jesus. Uh, I think they also thought that the execution and shameful death of their leader would squash the Jesus movement. They obviously miscalculated because here we are 2,000 years and the Jesus movement continues. It's interesting. Um, and there's a lot you can say here. The very method of death that ended up happening with Jesus, crucifixion, which was a cruel and uncommon and embarrassing way to die. It was used for common cri- criminals and not common criminals, but like insurrectionists and others. And yet this very method of death would become really an apologetic for Jesus' divinity because of the way that it s- signified being cursed. You know, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming cursed for us. For it is written, curses everyone that hangs on a tree, Galatians 3.3 3 says. Let's talk about Pilate. So here's Pilate. This political grenade is handed in Pilate's lap. Clearly the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, is not operating in good faith. They conduct an unjust trial with false testimony. They've already violated Jesus' civil rights by abusing him at the trial, which Jesus, by the way, pointed out and appealed to his rights as a, as a citizen. They were calling for an innocent man to be executed by the state. They're way above the ceremonial law here. They assumed by shoving it over to Pilate and asking for him to sign off on the crucifixion, their hands would be clean. But think of Pilate's nightmare. He's already weakened by his previous missteps and his clumsy efforts to correct them. He's on thin ice in Rome. He can't even go home and talk about this because his wife, who some historians believe actually became a convert to Christianity, was a closet follower of Jesus perhaps, pleads with Pilate to release Jesus because she was disturbed by a dream the night before his trial. Uh, You see this in Matthew 27. Pilate knows one more incident of unrest and Rome comes calling, not only yanks him from his position, but when rulers in the Roman Empire were recalled, they, they usually just weren't taken back to Rome. A lot of times they were executed or forced to commit suicide. If you read a lot of Roman history, there's a, a great novel uh, about Pilate's life that is pretty close to historical accuracy written by Paul Meyer that really talks about this that I highly recommend. But So this is why, smartly, the religious leaders appealed to Pilate and said, if you release this man, you're not a friend of Caesar. You're no Caesar's friend. They appealed to, to his vanity, to his wanting to hang on to power. So he faced an agonizing choice. Let Jesus go and have this unrest or kill an innocent man. It was the biggest crisis of his political life. The thing is, he didn't even want to be part here. He didn't want to be part of it. He actually tried to pawn this off on Herod. Antipas. And that Herod said, no, 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 this is Pilate's issue. This is a Judean thing. There's not a Galilean thing. This is the jurisdiction of Judea. Sorry, you can't dump, dump it on my plate. Nobody wanted to deal with this. Uh, Pilate knew he was, Jesus was not an insurrectionist. He had listened to what Jesus words. He knew Barabbas was. He knew the other two that were scheduled to be executed were, but he knew Jesus wasn't. Um, he listened to what Jesus said. He declared in Luke 2, 23, 4, I find no grounds for charging this man. Uh, in other words, there's no there's no crime against Rome here. There's nothing here. Um, he's trying to tell the religious leaders that they don't have a legal case, but they would not yield. Uh, so there's back and forth negotiations that are held outside of Pilate's palace. 
and that Sanhedrin are unyielding. They insist Jesus be executed by the state. They brought him up on charges against the Roman Empire, which is how they would get Rome involved in the case. They accuse Jesus of stirring up the people. So what was he supposed to do? So first he tries to defer the trial to Herod. Herod says, no, <laughs> this is not mine. Herod's not going to give Pilate cover. So he's sent back to Pilate, and he's back to square one. He has one more move. Every year, he would release a political prisoner, a Jewish prisoner, close to the day Jewish people commemorated Passover. It was kind of an attempt for him to build goodwill when Jewish people would celebrate their own freedom from bondage in Egypt. So he thinks, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll humiliate Jesus. I'll put him, I'll dress him up in a mock robe, ugly crown of thorns on his head. I'll flog him a little bit. That'll be enough humiliation to satisfy the anger of the religious authorities and put down this movement. And then I'll offer them the opportunity to choose a prisoner to set free. And surely they're not going to pick Barabbas, the insurrectionist. They're going to pick Jesus, who they know is innocent. But nope, they cried out for Barabbas. So Pilate has no choice. Uh, he doesn't want to do this, but he knows he has to do this. So he, his future is flashing before his eyes. He knows Jesus is innocent. He knows he's unworthy of Roman execution. Yet he also knows that if he releases Jesus, a riot's going to ensue and he's, he's done. So he washes his hands and he turns over the innocent one to be crucified. What I think is really powerful about the interactions with Jesus and Pilate, and they're, they're recorded in the Gospels, but John records the most of them. And I think it's really good for us to read them over Easter, is that if you read the way that Jesus is interacting with Pilate here, Pilate's asking him questions. Pilate's essentially pulling him into his chambers and saying, can you help me out here? I know you're innocent, but help me. Help me help you. Pilate is assuming that he has the power over Jesus' life. He's saying to Jesus, who must look pathetic, this itinerant rabbi with no place to lay his head, with cheap clothes on, who's beaten and ragged and, de and seemingly desperate with very little power. He's saying, listen, I want to help you, but can you, do, can you do something for me? What he doesn't understand is actually Pilate is the one who is desperate. Pilate is the one who is helpless. Jesus is the one who has power. And Jesus says some profound things to him. Essentially, no one can take my life. And you think you have power over me, but actually I have power over you. And the power you have, Pilate, um, he says this in John 19, 10 and 11. I love this. It says, so Pilate said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? You would have no authority over me at all, Jesus answered him, if it hadn't been given to you from above. This is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. This is a stunning answer. In other words, Jesus is saying, I, I laid my life down. You think you're the one killing me, but you're not. I also think what's happening here is Jesus is pursuing Pilate. What, what's on trial here is not Jesus. You see, Jesus' death and resur resurrection was foreordained before the beginning of the world. We see this in, in, in the book of Acts where Peter says, this is all the plan of God. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels. Jesus could have got out of this. Jesus already accepted the cup of God's wrath in the garden. This was happening. So Jesus is really not on trial. Pilate is on trial. The real person at stake here is Pilate. His soul is at stake. And Jesus is pleading with him and telling him and pursuing him, which is just a, 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 a marvelous interaction. Jesus is aiming straight for Pilate's heart as if to say, you don't, I know you don't quite want to be here. You don't want to be in this position with your entire political future on the line. You don't understand what's happening. And I'm here to help you see into your soul and find salvation. And Pilate's response is, what is truth? Is anything even knowable? Can I even know this? You see, deep in Pilate's heart and in every heart is a longing to understand the meaning of life, to know and be known by the one who declares himself the way, the truth, and the life. And sadly, we know that despite Jesus' appeals, Pilate caves to the demands of the religious leaders and wrote a death sentence for an innocent man. And yet I'm struck by the way that Pilate preserved Jesus for death. After the beating, the flogging. Pilate stood Jesus before the mob and declared, behold the man. This is a bit of a way of a mockery, but he's also unknowingly making a bold declaration that this is the man. This is the son of God. This is Jesus, the second Adam. 
This is the one who fulfills what Adam, the first Adam, could not. This is the, the God-man who has come to save our sins. And then on the cross, uh, Pilate affixes a sign, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Again, another double meaning. He meant to mock, but it really had a double meaning. I'm curious, in my sanctified imagination, I like to, I like to imagine that Pilate later went home with tremendous guilt sending an innocent man to death. Maybe he washed his hands and never thought about Jesus again, but I don't think so. His wife is thinking about it and was tormented, and I bet he was tormented too. And maybe we can imagine that one day Pilate realized the one that his guilt for putting Jesus on the cross was covered by Jesus accepting the guilt and the punishment and the God's wrath for Pilate. You see, all of us are really like Pilate. We have all, because of our sin, put Jesus on the cross. All of us have an opportunity to find salvation and freedom in Christ. We can have our sins forgiven. We can be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus because of what he did for us. He was the innocent one who, sh who died in our place. I hope today, as you're listening, you think about this. That if you had not made a move toward Jesus, if you not have seen him as your Savior and Lord, today might be the day that you do. Would you do that? And thank you for joining me today on the Characters of Easter. If you want more information about this book, you can go to danieldarling.com slash Easter. The Characters of Easter podcast is a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. We hope you'll also check out Dan Darling's book, The Characters of Easter, The Villains, Heroes, Cowards, and Crooks Who Witnessed History's Biggest Miracle. It's available from Moody Publishers on Amazon.com or wherever you buy your books. You can find more from Dan and all his latest books and podcasts by visiting danieldarling.com. If you liked what you just listened to, would you just take a second and tell your friends about us? Maybe leave us a rating on your favorite podcast app? This podcast is produced by Kelly Givens and Stephen Sanders, with editorial oversight provided by me, Stephen McGarvey. To find more great Christian podcasts like this, check out the rest of our shows at lifeaudio.com.